Welcome to episode seven of the Eyes and Ears podcast slash live stream. I am your co-host, Brad. With me, as always, is Elon Osborne. Hello, How Elon. How are Greetings, we today? salutations, all. La, la, yes. la, la, la. Yeah, I didn't practice that intro at all, by the way. I just said it and it happened. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully you guys are joining us uh, and you're doing well. Uh, we are going to be talking about something that I think is really, I don't know, it could be talked about like to infinity and beyond mm -hmm. Disney. Don't copyright strike us. But it can <laughs> literally be talked about so much. And that is diminishing returns when it comes to home theater stuff, like home theater gear, uh, speakers, displays, what have you. There's always that point where you get the most performance at a certain price point and then it just balloons after that you know you're you're buying for aesthetics or a name or or whatever so we're going to kind of dive into that and talk about it and um, kind of our thoughts on that our opinions like where is the line on certain components and and mm -hmm. you know should you cross that line like when is maybe the time to cross that line um you know we hear a lot about in game and you know, in-game components and all that stuff. And it's like, is it ever truly in-game? So lots of just kind of fun things to, um, I hate to say this, unpack, but it's really what it is because it's it, there's a lot of stuff here that can be talked about. And we want to hear from you guys too. Um, if you are in the chat, um, go ahead and say hello. We got Michael here. Hey, Mikey. Hey. I always feel uh, left out because he just says, yo, Elon. And I'm just, I'm over here. No, I don't I really don't care. <laughs> hey, Michael, what's nah, going on, man? Yeah, Joel is here as usual. Thank you, Joel, for joining us. Um, but before we get started, I do want to ask Elon, what the hell you been up to, man? It's been a couple weeks. Anything new uh, and exciting? I mean, not really. Uh, well, actually, um, my wife and I have been, again, going back and forth uh, with the uh, in-ceiling speakers, uh, since I want to put some in-ceiling speakers as mm -hmm. my rounds in the ceiling behind our listing position in the living room. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I was doing some calculations and some geometry, and the, the angle in which the in-ceiling speakers are pointed at because they're not the kind that just point straight down. They are angled a little bit inside yeah. of the housing. And uh, they're at, uh, well, the, is it my just contact... the driver? Like, I'm sorry, is it the dri is the driver angled as well? Or is it just like, can the tweeter be aimed yes. freely and the driver has an angle to it as well? Or No, you, you can't actually move anything. It is just a oh, static, okay. it's a Got static it. angle mm -hmm. um, that's just permanent. Um, the, my contact at golden ear said that it was at a 30 degree angle, Okay. but I think, I think from, since it's it like a little... ceiling mounted, I think he meant 60 degrees. Like mm. it depends on what, it depends on where you're drawing the line, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because honestly, if, if it's a 30 degree angle from the ceiling, that's shooting like way over my head, you know? If, if it's like, I don't know, like say it's 10 feet in front of me or 10 feet behind me or something, yeah. that's yeah. going to be shooting over my head no matter what, if it's 30 degrees. Um, but if it's 60 degrees, then, then yeah, that's more like it. Yeah. That's more of what I was hoping for. Um, but, <laughs> but I told her that and I, I did some measurements and I'm like, okay, so with that being said, 60 degrees would be right about here like basically 10 feet behind us, oh, okay. which is kind yeah. of encroaching on the kitchen at that point, since it's an open concept layout. And like the look on her face when she realized how far back they would be, I was like, Ugh. it's like a, you got an uphill battle there. It sounds like. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, you know, that night I kind of went to bed angry, <laughs> but just because, yeah, just because we were going back and forth and they're like, just another thing that I had to deal with in this yeah. situation. Um, but the next day, I kind of ran through some specs in my head or like just different alternatives. And the thing about having the 
pass the soundbar on my mantle where it is currently. Um, you know, if we wanted to get like festive on holidays and stuff, normally we decorate the mantle, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, those three major hol holidays. And with the soundbar there, we can't really do that because the soundbar takes up almost the entire mantle. Right. So, you know, aesthetically, it kind of just is an eyesore, even though it's very nice and sleek and black, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I was thinking, okay, what if, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sort of create some sort of like rig to where I can at least not like officially put holes in the ceiling, but at least somehow be able to test it out before putting holes in the ceiling. But right, they, right. you know, Golden Ear sent me four in ceiling speakers originally because I wanted two in the back and possibly two in the front if I had that soundbar below the TV. But I came to a compromise with my wife and I was like, okay, what if we got rid of the sound bar so then we can decorate the mantle however we want and it's not just some black bar staring at us. Yeah. And what if I did three in ceilings up, at the, up in the front and just forget about the rears? Because even yeah. right now, because that's how it is right now, it's just a 3.1. I've got the sound bar mm -hmm. and then a, a little subwoofer in the corner. And I mean, we were watching, because honestly, I I switched out the Marantz Cinema 70S for the uh, Emotiva MC1. Because hmm. uh, I wanted to see, you know, is there any differences? Am I getting a, a better experience with a quote unquote preamp as opposed to an AVR that just mm -hmm. so happens to have right. pre-outs. Um, so I did that. And honestly, I, I liked, it definitely had a brighter quality to it, especially watching like action movies and stuff. Yeah. Glass breaking and things like that. What definitely came out a lot more punchier. Um, the bass response was, much louder, uh, at least by default, because uh, I didn't really mess with the the bass response or the subwoofer level all that much, besides crossover, which I just set it at right. eighty hertz. Um, but yeah, I had to turn it down a lot compared to what I had it set up as with the Marantz. So, whatever Emotiva was doing, they really pushed that subwoofer or LFE signal just by default or something. Wow. So that was cool. It, it, it like not in a bad way, in a good way. Yeah. Um, so that was cool, but I didn't really, I noticed this a little bit when I tested out the MC one, but hooking it up this time around, just because it's, it was getting everyday use and every single time that we switched from a particular, because we just use our TV apps, um, mm -hmm. our, our smart TV apps, you know, right. Hulu and Disney Plus, whatever. Yeah. This is on the frame, the Samsung frame. Yes, they, correct. Oh. Um, and every time we watched something and went back to the home screen, there was this little pop or like little like staticky ripples it almost sometimes it even sounded like somebody like tearing fabric just just little short short little anomalies like that yeah but it was every single time that we switched it's basically Weird anytime hdmi or... was switching or when i switched to the nintendo switch and yeah so I, that was a little disappointing so I put the Marantz back in. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Long story short, the Marantz is back in. Um, but yeah, previously I didn't have, I can't remember the exact feature, what it's called, but there's some sort of feature in the Marantz Cinema 70S that like enhances surround a little bit. 
like dynamic EQ virtual, maybe virtualizes a little bit. Oh, okay. So that way, even if you just have ear level speakers, it tries to virtualize. Simulate, yeah. Yeah. Um, cause at first I was like, eh, I don't want that. Yeah. But yeah. I turned it on just this time around just to see, and it made a big difference. It was really cool. Um, it definitely sounded like stuff was going to the side a lot more. Um, not necessarily like up, but, or not, not necessarily off the ceiling, but definitely higher than the sound bar itself. So yeah. it, it definitely made a, a change. And we were watching the first Incredibles movie, the Pixar mm. movie. It's a great movie. I mean, Brad Bird, the director, I mean, he really knows how to do action and just story and people coming together and families and those relationships and stuff. So I really love Brad Bird's style yeah. and, and his just directing in general. But man, that those two, both of them, the Incredibles 1 and 2, have incredible sound. Just FYI, if you're wondering which Pixar movies are demo worthy, <laughs> both Incredibles are demo There's, worthy. Yeah. So, so yeah, it definitely made a, a difference and I really like it. So with that being said, I'm going to try and test it out with three in-ceiling speakers before okay. actually putting holes in the ceiling. Um, cause I mean, I, we could get away with just two up front. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you gotta have that center. So that dialogue yeah. has its own little pocket, you know, trust me. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, um, something that I just recently experienced before I kind of talk about what I've been doing. I just yeah. want to say hi to a howdy to a few folks here. Jeffrey is here again. Thank you, hey. Jeffrey, for joining us. Craig is here. Hi guys. Hey, Craig, how are you? Hi, Craig. Um, and Kevin is here. Kevin Gardner. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Evening, gents, he says. How you doing, Kevin, buddy? And uh, we have Mid Devil 1980. Hello again from Lansing, Michigan. Well, hello. Thank you for joining Hi. us from, from the Michigan area. And then uh, we had a comment. I think this is geared towards you, uh, Elon. Uh, Douglas Barrow said, I bought my Yamaha Aventage I I'm, I'm, I butchered that name. Sorry. RX A eight A plus clips reference premiere two five dot two dot zero today. Whoa. Congratulations! That's a mighty investment. That's awesome. Welcome, welcome to the club. Um, goal is to be seven dot two dot four in a few years. Started this whole journey for watching your Costco fifteen hundred dollars setup years ago, and that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is how I knew he was talking about Elon because I've never made a Costco <laughs> video before. Um, <laughs> That's awesome, man. That is yeah. Congrats, yeah, Doug. You, that's some you got some nice stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah, that's a man, good goal me, too. Let me tell you, like going that kind of ties into what I've been doing. Uh, if anybody here has seen my recent video about doing a revamp on my home theater, I have completed that. I'm working on the video. It's currently like a little under two hours now. Um, might have to split it into. Uh, but basically got the center channel out from the entertainment stand up on top of it and uh, put the display that I have, the LG C1 77 inch up on a floor stand. And th that was probably the best $100 investment I've ever made in my theater in my life. Mm. It's amazing. Wow. Um, it's super awesome. I ended up going on Facebook Marketplace and grabbing a couple of Pioneer BS 22s to match my side surrounds uh, for um a total of seven uh main speakers bed channels so I'm now seven channels <laughs> seven channels on the floor and four above and then four subwoofers um and yes that's that took a good four to five days which is why um so like over three three hours of footage of all of that and uh a lot of that's time lapse too so that's that's, that's a lot <laughs> a lot of time spent <laughs> doing it and then I spent another uh, so I think maybe some people in the comments may, maybe uh, uh, are the ones that asked this. Uh, have I looked at Odyssey 1 from a Obsessive Compulsive Audio File? I actually did the Odyssey 1 calibration a couple times. Very, very awesome. Um, and oh, that's wait. just using regular Odyssey. Yes, this is funny. This just came in here 37 seconds ago. 
before I could <laughs> even get to it. Uh, so I'll answer that right now, Jeffrey. We normally hold general questions till the end, but for you, I'll make it. No. Um, <laughs> so I will actually be talking about this in the um, like the revamp video. So I ran it, and it's don't. It, it is awesome. It is if you're looking for a quick way to get the most out of Odyssey better than what you can get like just from running it like on your receiver or whatever it's mm -hmm. fantastic my main issue um with it is it only corrects like it has a built-in curtain so it doesn't do any doesn't do any correction over like i think 300 hertz oh. and the the reason i say that's an issue for me is all of my main speakers are soft dome tweeters but then my height channels are like titanium tweeters they're like the Perian mm. audio clear 6c's they right. are very very bright and even they have a, a like a dip switch on it that can right. you can reduce the highs even with that reduced um the highs end up like after like say three three kilohertz mm. they're six to eight db hotter than everything else in the system whoa um, so they really call attention to themselves and some people like that me I ended up uh, doing his Supreme Odyssey calibration, which mm. essentially corrects the entire curve. I told Elon about this. Uh, it essentially, it corrects the entire curve. You can have your own house curve, uh, which I like. And basically, every single speaker in that system, this uses you know multi EQ XT32, but you're kind of cheating it. You're not actually using those points. You're using measurements you take in REW, and you're converting them to. It's it's. It took like eight hours to follow this. Yeah. Um, took a long time. Um, but I am floored with the results. Every every speaker follows the curve pretty precisely. Like wow. There's such like a cohesiveness that, that I got close with doing his like manual calibration using graphic EQ on the my Denon or, or before. Mm -hmm. But this is like on a whole other level. It's far more accurate. So I'm thinking about doing a video um, discussing why, like when to choose Odyssey one versus doing like the Supreme audio calibration or even the more advanced one, which is like his Odyssey art, which is kind of Whoa. even like even more intense. Um, that may be like my next goal, but honestly, I spent so much time calibrating. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of want to enjoy the system right now, and then yeah, go down sure. that road later. Um, but Jeffrey did ask, "How much did you boost your subs with your latest house curve?" Um, so uh, my house curve is no longer the way it used to be. Basically, yeah. it's uh, it's basically the entire. It goes over the entire frequency range. So if you've watched my old mini DSP tutorials. Um, where I like I boost up until like 30 dB and then I slope down. I don't do that anymore. Basically, it taps out at like 77 and a half decibels, and then over the like from like basically 10 hertz all the way down all the way up to 20,000 hertz, mm -hmm. um, it goes from 77 and a half decibels at like 10 hertz to uh, like 70 decibels around there, 71 decibels at 20,000. So there's just mm -hmm. a gradual like slope. Um, so really if, if you're, if you're targeting like 75 DB, they're only three decibels higher or hotter, but because you're sloping down at the highs, it, it does increase the base a bit more. I don't use dynamic EQ or anything like that. So it really just makes it, uh, sound it's like have a far more balanced sound. Damn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the thumbs up, man. <laughs> Happened Gets again. You every it time. my screen. <laughs> oh. Um, but yeah, I will actually be doing that. Um, I want to read this to you. I've been meaning to go through that too, to do the Atmos speaker EQs. Um, I think there might be some code edit you can make to A1 to extend the frequency. Yes, that, that was going to be my next, I was actually going to comment on his video and, and ask him if there was a way to do that mm -hmm. because that's really, honestly, Odyssey one took like zero time compared to Supreme, the Supreme Odyssey calibration. Yeah. Most people, if if they're happy with the correction up to 300 hertz, which most people want a curtain anyway that kind of know what they're like, know about home theater and are really into this. Um, it, it's the you like most people are going to be fine with that. It's just like the use cases like me and like Jeffrey that you really need 
um, to tame those high frequencies in your Atmos if you want everything to kind of blend together. Because yeah. uh, with the Odyssey One, I noticed like it sounded great, but the Atmos speakers, the height channels are really, really prominent, really mm. prominent in the mix. Again, some people like that. It got to the point where it was like distracting. It was yeah. they were, and they were like. Theoretically, they were level matched with all the other speakers, but they were so right. hot, like they were hot on the high end enough that it was like this too much. Um, Can you then go back in manually and just kind of, kind of turn those high frequencies down a bit? Like with Odyssey One, I'm not sure <laughs> because basically you're you're editing the, uh, you're kind of hacking Odyssey in a way, so you yeah. can't really make any adjustments to the curve mm -hmm. um, once you're done, I believe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Jeffrey even mentions, I don't have as much time before to do these insane cows. Yeah. Oh, seven month old first baby. Now, congratulations, man. That, yeah. Wow. You, yeah. you need, <laughs> you need all the downtime you can get in calibration <laughs> while I find it enjoyable. Um, after a certain point, I'm just like, I just want to listen to this stuff, man. I want to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I just want to watch movies. Exactly. Exactly. Um, good to know. He says, I'm still running with plus 10 dB to 30 Hertz and then to zero at hundred. That's still a great house curve. It just, over time, it got a little too intense for me. Mm. Um, I like more, like, I don't, I don't know if it's like just gotten older, but I've, I kind of like a little more balance to my, to my sound overall. Yeah. But I think the nice thing is knowing where that line is, like, you know, like if I want to boost, like if I'm listening to music or like, maybe watching a concert film like uh, Metallica Through the Never, which is kind of one of my favorite go-tos. Um, I like to boost the bass a little bit, you know? Yeah. Just because it's music. Like, for me, it's like I'm not... It. It's like, uh, okay, I need to find a level where, like, the kick drum's really, like, punchy, mm -hmm. but it's not, like, overbearing on the whole thing. So, um, yeah, I will be talking about that in the next video, and then I will also be doing a video kind of comparing Odyssey 1 and... The supreme odyssey calibration just talking about it because like this having that kind of access for free uh to yeah. do this stuff without even needing to buy multi eqx or anything this is just using the 20 dollars editor app right that's awesome this is super awesome yeah that is cool um all right well i think we've got the pleasantries out of the way right uh, actually one the... more thing one more thing yes uh, i just want to give a shout out to all of our podcast listeners in denmark yes um That's for crazy whatever reason i mean obviously united states is number one when it comes to the percentage of people who are downloading our podcast but denmark is a close second so cheers to all you in denmark downloading our podcast right? That's we amazing. appreciate you and uh Sorry, I don't know any Danish I phrases or anything. I don't either. <laughs> so, yay. I don't either. Hooray for Denmark. You yay. guys are cool. All right. So thank you again, Denmark, for your support and for listening. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yay. So before we dive into this whole diminishing returns thing, let me get this stuff out of the way here. So you got a topical question. As usual, put a TQ then ask about the current topic so we can see it. Opinions are always welcome, even if they're wrong. I'm kidding. They're they're not welcome at all. Um, I'm kidding. You guys can, <laughs> we want to hear from you in the comments. The whole point of this, doing this live, instead of like pre-recording it and then releasing it in a podcast form is so we can interact with you. And we're both like on YouTube anyway, so why not? Right? <laughs> yeah. And then if you have a general question, um, put a GQ in there, just like the magazine and ask away. Uh, we typically try to get those done near the end of the broadcast, but if we have some downtime, someone needs to run to the bathroom or something, we might just say, hey, we'll answer a few GQs. And then, yeah, boy. finally, Super Chats and Super Stickers. These are not required, uh, but they do show your support for us and are highly recommended by myself and Elon. Yeah. Um, they, uh, but, but don't feel like the, like you, the only way to get your question answered is by, you know, throwing a super chat or super sticker in there. We will answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, but this will get your question or whatever to the forefront and it just shows your support for us. So thank you so much. And if, uh, anyone watches this, <clears throat> excuse me, at a later point 
and you're the guy that gave me a $50 super thanks on one of my many DSP videos. Whoa. You're awesome. Thank you so wow. much. Yeah, that was that was nice to wake up to the other morning. <laughs> so thank you. If you're watching this in the future or now, appreciate it so much. You guys are all... I, I thank the Ooh. person already, but uh, thanks again for 50 a fifty dollar that that just made my morning. <laughs> so anyway, diminishing return, the law of diminishing t returns. What does that even mean? Well, Elon, I'm gonna you let gotta, you, you got a bell curve. You gotta yes. You you, you get to a, a point curve. with anything, really, cars, musical instruments, like like basically anything in life, right? You you're gonna get to a point where you run into kind of the max potential at a certain price point or a certain product whatever and then once you go over that it's just kind of extra bells and whistles essentially right you're you're with speakers you're kind of you're paying for aesthetics you might be paying for i don't know some crazy like materials that go into the speaker cone or tweeter or whatnot like i was saying to elon before though a five thousand dollar speaker versus a twenty five to thirty thousand dollar speaker are you getting 20 to 25 to 30 thousand dollars improvement math, my math ain't mathing right now but uh, <laughs> the 20 to 25 thousand dollar improvement probably not um, no. and so typically what happens is and we've heard it time and time again right uh people will have a system that they don't think sounds the best that it can right and so what do they do first and foremost well maybe i need a new receiver this has better room correction on it okay well that only gets you so far right room correction can't fix like the worst sounding room in the world so you go okay well that didn't really fix so maybe we just need new speakers so you buy like really expensive speakers and guess what it sounds a little bit better but you're still not addressing the main problem you're putting band-aids on the main issue right which is your room your room is basically what's going to affect how everything sounds um low frequencies high frequencies mids it all plays into that you got all hardwood floors and you you know your kitchen's off to the side it's all open yeah you're gonna have like a kind of echoey an echo chamber <laughs> pretty much right yeah. like it's gonna sound like a concert hall no matter what you do um conversely if you actually instead took that money that you spent on the Denon and Marantz and stuff and bought acoustic treatments or paid someone uh to kind of does like look at your room and go you should place this here place that here or you know look at proper speaker positioning things like that that will actually go much further than just like throwing money at a problem and trying to fix it so with that said though it does come down to diminishing returns really mm -hmm. how much money are do you need to spend on something right and elon i know you have experience with this I definitely have experience with it. Um, well, first, first and foremost, I want to get this off my chest. Get um, it. Just because of some comments I've received in the past on uh, particular videos. Uh, having done this channel for almost four years now, um, I have drawn a line. And in my mind, I consider anything whether that be a receiver, speaker, whatever. Anything under $1,000 is budget to me. Just because now I've seen the whole spectrum, right. having done this channel and seen all the other stuff that's out there because my goodness, there's so many speaker brands out there. There's, yeah. oh, there's know, a ton, so many man. AVRs to choose from, preamps, et cetera. So going forward, just know that in my mind, anything a thousand dollars or less is budget. Because I remember just the other day, it was maybe, maybe last week, it was fairly recent. My first ever product review on my channel was the Klipsch 5.1 home theater pack. And, you know, that was September of 2020 when I released that. And somebody commented, because that particular system, I don't even think they sell it anymore. Um, mm, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that's been taken over by the 
5.1.4 cinema reference theater pack or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's just, that's a bygone era. But at the time, uh, I think it was being sold for like four fifty at Costco, and then sometimes it goes on sale for three hundred fifty dollars. Um, but you can even you could even get it on Amazon for like two hundred ninety eight dollars at certain times of the year. So right. this is like you and this is five speakers. This is the center channel, front left and right, and rear surrounds, and a subwoofer. Wow! All for you know potentially under $300. That is what I consider like micro budget yeah. because you're getting five speakers and a subwoofer for under $300. That's for people like me back in the day that just needed something and didn't want to spend an arm and a leg. And somebody yeah. commented, ha, budget, he says. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? What more do you want? for three hundred dollars yeah you're getting exactly, so yeah. much for three hundred dollars already i mean you could get a three hundred dollar speaker just by itself or, or but, just spend three hundred dollars on a on a receiver alone yeah, like exactly. that's it and like you i was i i bought a kenwood home theater in a box back in like i want to say like i was in high school um this yeah. is back in the just adobe digital dts days you know no true hd none of that dvds were insanely popular they were coming more and more popular mm -hmm. uh i paid 500 dollars or 600 dollars, and then the toslink cable was another 50 bucks or something whatever you know i was i was young <laughs> naive stupid i bought everything from circuit city what's funny i still actually have the stands that i bought from circuit city and they still they're completely fine <laughs> uh, they're ugly as hell but they're completely fine yeah. um but you know that just goes to show you though that that it's always perspective right of someone mm -hmm. who you know describes budget as one thing they may not have that same perspective which is fine um but it's like we do need to kind of you know draw the line or or, or say the line is here you know i think I, on my i think it was my pb 1000 pro mm -hmm. review i called it svs i, I said this it's exactly verbatim i remember SVS's entry level subwoofer. For all Which intents and is. purposes, it is their their kind of entry point. It's either that or the SB one thousand Pro. Mm -hmm. I think it's slightly less for that one, but it's yeah. still it's their entry level subwoofer. And someone kind of dogged me in the comments for calling it entry level. And I said, well, I said it's SVS's entry level. I could say yeah. the same thing about whatever you know, um, like other speaker made like paradigms entry level is this or uh martin logan's entry level is that or you know like basically i wasn't calling it entry level i was calling it this is what it takes to get into the entry level svs stuff not just mm -hmm. entry level in general and as someone who literally has entry level speakers i consider them entry level which are the pioneer um Andrew Jones speakers, the second iteration, not the first one with the metal grills, but the second one with the removable ones. Mm. Those are, those are cheap when I bought them. The center channel was ninety dollars. The yeah. front towers were one hundred and seventy each. Um, the bookshelves were ninety nine a pair. You know, like wow, yeah. They they those are extra to me. Like at the time, I couldn't afford anything else, and I haven't replaced them yet because. I'm being very picky about what I replace them with. Yeah. You know, it's like, I want to choose the right thing. Um, you know, and so like, those are what I would consider entry level, but I'm sure someone would come along and be like, well, they're cheaper speakers. Yeah, absolutely. But like price to performance, those are actually rated pretty highly. They're not the greatest speakers, but at that price point, they perform, they kind of punch well above their weight. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in my opinion, there are a ton of better things out there, obviously. Uh, but, you know, am I like I paid like, OK, 90 bucks for the center. Right. We're talking about diminishing returns. The performance I've gotten out of that ninety dollar center is crazy. Yeah. So looking at a five, six hundred dollar center, am I getting five or six hundred dollars more performance out of it? You know, like that's that's kind of what has been difficult about upgrading those speakers. Mm -hmm. Now, 
you and I were in kind of a different position than most consumers in that, like, if we get something for review, sometimes companies just like say, Hey, you know, make a couple videos on it and it's yours. Or other times we can buy it at a pretty substantial discount. So that kind of eases the pain of, yeah. of upgrading. Right. But at the same time, it's like, I'm not throwing money away. Cause I don't, I mean, I don't have a ton of disposable income, you know? I don't think you, I mean, you have kids. So you like, don't? You, no, I think, I think most people also that watch our channels think that we do. And it's like this, all this stuff is, is like held together by pencils and like scotch tape. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like what you don't see behind the camera is something else. Um, but it's like, yeah, that whole, like, am I going to get like so much more enjoyment out of something that costs, you know, a few thousand dollars more maybe i definitely yeah. like want to get more efficient speakers because these are you know like kind of not very sensitive kind of hard to drive a little bit um mm -hmm. but it's also something where i'm like these might sound better with an amp like a separate amp instead of yeah you know because they are a little they're not as sensitive so i kind of like having them around i mean honestly that's why i haven't upgraded they sound great for what they are um mm -hmm. you know and that kind of does get into the whole diminishing returns they are purely entry level but i don't know someone mowing a lawn outside yeah hey joel actually was in the same boat as me right now look at that he took a couple years looking for the speaker that would replace my a uh, ag pioneers aj pioneers that would fit my budget yeah man Joel, if you don't mind answering, did you have the like the original series or did you have like the updated uh series like the FS fifty twos or the BS twenty twos or CS twenty twos? Um because the uh, the originals I still have a couple of those and they perform so poorly by comparison. <laughs> I was gonna use them as my back surrounds and that's what led me to Facebook Marketplace to grab a pair of BS twenty twos for forty bucks locally. Um yeah, man, those those old ones are just. Yeah, I could see why they the the they had trouble selling the second the second ones because they the 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 one the first ones were so bad like they were they were. Awful. Had you had you listened to them recently? No, they've honestly just been sitting out in our Florida room, um, collecting yeah. dust out there. I I have the center channel. Um, <laughs> oh he said <laughs> oh he had to stop mowing my lawn oh, that's <laughs> hilarious michael i did not know they had a third gen what oh have to look that up so were they the 53s or the 23s or something? i'm gonna have to look that up because that's not that honestly i don't know why i wouldn't like i know the 22s no longer like they're discontinued the 23s mm -hmm. or whatever, like the third gen might be discontinued as well. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, oh, wrong one. Uh, Kevin actually says, my system is low budget entry level. I found gear and recycle center and fixed it. Very lucky to have had gear given to me and wow. bought some stuff as returns or scratch and dent. Very grateful. Yeah, man, the used market or if you can find something, that's that can be like a gold mine. Like if you just have a friend yeah. who's like, hey, I don't really want these. You want them? You know, if you can get something for cheap, um, then yeah, that's uh, dude, that's super awesome. I'm I'm a big fan of like use gear as long as you test it before you buy it and kind of know what you're getting into. Um, yeah, man, it's like, um, oh man, I had a thought and then it decided to leave my brain. Getting older, man. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm older than you, so I don't think that. Uh, no, I, don't know. I think you're a couple years younger than I am. I'm 47. <laughs> no, I'm not. not 47. I'm not 47. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know having uh, while you're trying to get that thought back in your. Oh, it got okay. It came back. Go. go. Um, <laughs> uh, I think yeah, if used markets. I think speakers are one of the best things you can invest in in a used market just because speakers are 
they're so simple. It's a positive and a negative electrical signal. And that's about it. I mean, yeah. unless it's somebody who's just been playing extra loud music for hours and hours and hours, you know, yeah, sure. Maybe they've blown out some things. Yeah. But if, you know, you could probably find a YouTube channel or a YouTube video out there on how to repair broken speakers if you have a particular issue. Um, but I mean, I, I get how like AVRs probably not so much are great in the used market. Yeah. Um, just cause you don't, you know, like somebody driving a car, you don't know how they drove the car, right. Right. <laughs> you know, what their driving habits are. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing with an AVR. How, how often did they play music through it? How often did they watch movies? Yeah. How loud did they make it get? Um, how, how cold or hot, or is it climatized where they are? Um, yeah. I so mean, those, those, yeah. You know, cause just the, com the components inside, there's so many components inside of yeah. an AVR that it's just going to fail eventually. Yeah. Uh, whereas speakers, I mean, you know, that's why vintage speakers are such a big thing because yeah. they can last for decades yep you might have to you know uh, I, I think my friend michael youth man had to replace the crossovers in his uh uh clips la scalas at some point um yeah. because they literally like they died like one something just died mm -hmm. but i mean they're from like what, the 70s 80s something like that it was i mean yeah i i have speakers still like i have some old clips uh I don't even remember what they are. Honestly, they're not like heresies or anything like that. They're just kind of like, I literally was working at a self storage place. Some guy moved his stuff out of like closed the storage unit and he left two speakers in there and I called them and I was like, Hey, like you just left these clips in here. Do you want them? And he's like, Nope, they are all yours if you want them. Cause we were talking about like audio and stuff. Yeah. I was like, Oh, thanks man. And I, I like had to like get it approved by the, Cause we're not supposed to take stuff like we're just supposed to toss it i was like i'm not tossing these clip speakers you know like oh, they have some light water damage on them but they're massive they're like this big you know so like they've been my workout speakers for ages um ever since like 2014 basically wow. and they still work man they still work Dang. um yeah. they're not the most visually appealing speakers um because of the water damage and stuff but yeah yeah uh you know like Kevin actually mentioned something that I thought was interesting. He said he found my 70 inch sharp Aquas TV in the recycle center, fixed it seven years ago. Happy. Um, wow. Yeah, that is, I would, I would kind of classify displays like TVs in the same ballpark as like AVRs in terms of like the used market. Cause you, especially like yeah. if you're dealing with OLEDs and stuff, you never know how someone abuse, like you abuse those. Mm -hmm. Um, it not that like especially i'm mainly talking about anything be before like this like the lg cx series oleds yeah. uh, like c9 c8 things like that um that are notorious for kind of like they hadn't quite figured out the whole image retention burn-in thing so much where mm -hmm. those are more like prevalent on those models um over time like i think one has like the it's like an orange blob that could show up on one of them. It's weird. I think the C8 yeah. or something. But yeah, that, that's really hard. Like even like projectors and stuff, like you never know if someone just threw in a cheap bulb off of Amazon, yeah. right? You can get them for hundred bucks, but like they're not going to be the same as the OEM bulb. So all that stuff's like really, you, you got to know what to look for there. Um, yeah. You can still find great deals. You just have to have a more kind of keen eye on that stuff. Well, plus, um, um, I mean, kind of going along with this from Kevin Gardner, AVRs are like cell phones. Tech changes yearly, but starting with older gear is a great place to start learning the hobby. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, that that's kind of the same thing with TVs nowadays, too. Yeah. Um, because, you know, TVs used to just be TVs and like, hey, it's a picture. But like, you know, just like cell phones and just like anything electronics 
nowadays it has technology that's you know be, going to become obsolete just in a few years or yeah ai technology or better upscaling technology and mm -hmm. etc so now it just seems like everything everything revolving around elect consumer electronics in general is just made to last for a few years yeah um, because yeah. they they understand the manufacturers understand that it's technology is moving so quickly that they can just hopefully try and get some people to buy <laughs> this particular this tv now, yeah, yeah yeah but i mean it, and even with lg like what do you think about the fact that lg is coming out or all tv manufacturers are coming out with something every year just like i don't know it's like apple popularized this idea of the yearly stuff cycle having of, to come out yeah. every year yeah it's like you just don't <laughs> yeah just kind of hold off make some improvements maybe like a, a new iphone comes out every three to five years and it just blows all of our collective minds when a new one comes out because now it's just like eh, last year's model is just a tiny bit not as good as this year's model yeah you know it just well doesn't yeah make sense. yeah i mean with like lg stuff it it really i mean if i'm being honest if we're looking at like going from like the cx to the c1 to the c2 to the c3 mm -hmm. there are more or less iterative I, I would consider them iterative upgrades in in terms of like hdr performance you're not you're not gaining really enough to like i bought my c1 when the c2 came out because mm. i was able to get a killer deal on the c1 yeah um the c2 at the time was i don't know five six hundred dollars more for really not much else uh it had some uh, it had a gaming feature that i don't really use but i um i got it like like i lost my train of thought there for a second sorry just like you earlier brain fog <laughs> yeah um no, old, like like basically, the uh, in the 4K 120 mode in the like the C2 onward, they got rid of black frame insertion, so you can no longer like use that feature, which is can be useful for gaming because it kind of emulates the way like CRT motion is um, mm. at 4K 120. You can also do 4K 60. Um, I don't really use it, but I don't like not having the feature for like when I want to use it. So yeah. for something like that's really easy to run, perfect example, you made a video on it recently, Planet of Lana. I can do 4K 120 on my PC on, with that, no problem. Yeah. I can use black frame insertion and it looks very, very, like the motion on that game, it looks like super great. I mean, mm -hmm. LG motion, it, it, like once you get past 60, already looks amazing anyway, um, right. over like LCD. But um, yeah, I just didn't want to be locked out of that. Whereas like the G series, those seem to get the most improvement, right? So like the G1, I was looking at that hardcore, but I like at the time I needed a stand. I needed something with a stand. I didn't want to have to buy a third party, whatever. Um, I almost bought one on green toe, you know? And I was like, I had it in my card. I was about to buy it. And I was like, ah, I can't do it. But like, you know, the HDR performance on that is substantially well, i don't say substantially but it's gotten substantially better each display like each iteration and i think the g4s are, are looking to be like 150 50 percent brighter mm -hmm. than like the g3s i think um but honestly if if you consider those high end i don't know that that might be like other than like the theater seats that i have in my system which were given to me i, I didn't pay for those mm -hmm. um that's like the highest end component in my system that I paid for, like paid full price for. I didn't get at a discount or anything other than it being on sale because the C2s were coming out. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's basically like, you know, I knew that like I wanted an OLED and I'd never had an OLED prior to that coming off the Vizio P-Series Quantum X, which was a, a hot steaming pile of garbage. <laughs> Um, after they updated the firmware and borked it and took like a year and a half to completely fix it. And I still don't think it's completely fixed, but I sold that at a loss and paid like, put like $500 with that and got a 77 inch. And dude, I love mm -hmm. the, like at the time, like 
the pic like when it worked the picture quality on the vizio was great like it was for the price it was amazing at an 85 inch screen nice inky blacks um but that set was just plagued with so many issues that i couldn't and the gaming the gaming stuff was like an hdmi 2.1 never really worked properly so dang yeah, it. anyway yeah yeah and so like that you know i had always been a fan of like that price of performance they seem to be kind of on an uphill trajectory vizio and then all of a sudden it was just like well you just shit the bed man like what the heck <laughs> like why like why did you do this and then they like, we don't see anything wrong so it was really hard to get any type of answers from their support and it was it sucked man hmm. um but uh, so where so where do you uh well let's talk about avrs sure. where do you consider the the apex before the returns start to diminish um i mean i think this would probably be most people's answer and that would be like as kind of a get the most bang for the buck type of thing probably the the denon x 3800h that has yeah. scalability um if you add like separate amplification you can get more i think you can get more channels i can't remember but it kind of has yes. everything that you would want out of a modern avr without like i don't even remember how much it is but it's it, it's definitely not um cheap but in terms of like what you get like you could step up to like the 4800 for i don't know how much more you might get you know higher quality components built in but i think at that point you might consider going to like marantz you know yeah, get like exactly. the really high-end stuff yeah. or like the really kind of but see like to me like you're kind of running into those diminishing returns especially if you're considering external amplification or separate amplification yeah um you know the 3800 h will get you by for a while and then you could experiment with that stuff kind of like you know i'm i'm a yeah. like obviously i i'm a firm believer of buying like used avrs when it's uh when you know the person <laughs> You know, I bought my AVR, <laughs> the uh, the 6300H for 500, 500 bucks. Um, it's like five years old, but it's amazing. Like it just, it does everything that I need it to do other than HDMI 2.1, which is a non-issue now because of the eARC extractor. So it's like, I don't really need, I don't really, I'm not really looking at the 3800H. Everyone talks about Dirac and I really, I don't look at room correction anymore as like, that is, that is like the de facto of like, I need to get that because it has Dirac. I don't like, there are ways around things now that I've discovered, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, if you don't mind doing a little leg work, you don't need Dirac. Like that's just more like an extra bonus, you know? Plus I think most of the time you get to pay an extra $200 uh, of yes. license fee anyway. Um, well, Dirac is good for those who don't necessarily want to put eight hours like you did into... Exactly. Well, precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they, yeah. they just want to have a, a really good, you know, set it up, go through all the steps, you know, hold hold my hand, Dirac, <laughs> and, yes. then, yeah. and then the, the result is amazing. So yeah. I get it. I get it how people will lean towards that because yeah. it's one of the best automatic or at least you know it'll take you along the way and it, it almost anybody could get by doing it because it takes you step by step yeah um, there's not a lot of you know know-how that you have to have beforehand you don't have to do a lot of homework right or right. study up on you know room correction or frequencies or yeah. that kind of stuff it's just put the microphone here now yep. move it over here now move it over here yeah all right let's do subwoofers so yeah what i, I what i'll say to that is i do consider like dirac and even marv mentioned he bought multi eqx um, which i hope to check out soon i haven't heard back from my contact yet about that um mm -hmm. but they've said they've secured me a copy and a calibrated microphone so crossing my fingers um but i still consider those like 
kind of like there so like there's like the the main built-in odyssey that i think most people are going to run that aren't really maybe as deep into the hobby as we are because we are like most of us here enthusiasts right like we're we're the ones spent spending twenty dollars on the multi on the editor app or two hundred dollars on eqx or um dirac or or whatever um so even like i'd say like the logical step up is do the twenty dollar multi eq app if you kind of want to get your feet a little more wet but if you really want to dive in dirac or uh, multi EQX are far like are definitely in my opinion like more fully featured you have more options but it's not for like the faint of art most of the time like if you're someone who just wants to run room correction and be done with it with minimal fuss yeah. you're probably going to use the built-in stuff which unfortunately most of the time isn't going to get you great results right like everybody yeah. I think I, I think that's like a general consistent uh consist consensus I'm not drunk, guys, I swear. Um, uh, but then there's also, don't forget, there's Anthem. Like, there's uh, Arc Genesis. Yeah. Which I've heard nothing but amazing things about. Uh, right. I've heard as far as room correction goes, it's kind of like the pinnacle right now of, like, ease of use and, like, intrusiveness. Like, you don't have to go it Like, with Odyssey, there's... I mean, Elon, you've run Odyssey before. You know, you have to go in and fix the things that it's yeah. a, my speaker, you know, they may go down to 40 hertz, but I don't want to play in down to 40 hertz, you know? Like, I want the subs picking up that slack because, like, I'm trying to, you know, it's, they're just not as efficient. So, they're, they it, Odyssey still does some weird, strange things depending on the room. And so, you kind of have to go in there and tweak Dirac, less so. I found that you really don't have to do that. You set up a yeah. nice curve in Dirac, and you're pretty much good to go but i i do feel like depending on the version you have that's the other thing Dirac has like the main version and then you could add like something else like Dirac base control or whatever and it's yeah. like there's like and then multi there's, yeah and then there's multi base or multi subwoofer Dirac as well so yeah and it, it like makes it it makes it less consumer friendly because it's like why the hell like I thought I got the whole full featured one. I just bought the what what? Now I have to buy this and it just makes it so it's it's like it's more difficult for the end consumer to just get like get up and running, you know? It's like, "Oh my gosh." Um and then there's guys like me who's like, "I want all manual control," you know? It's like I don't yeah. mind spending that 8 hours doing something, but that is certainly not for everyone. I'm not saying that it is. It's like, you know, um yeah, I'm really like I can't wait to check out multi multi QX. I keep wanting to say multi EQX, and it's. <laughs> I feel like the name there is a little, a little misleading, like a little hard to say there. But um. But I, I I do like it. I don't like the only thing I I don't like about that on paper at least is you can't use like a U mic with it. You have to use like either the mic that oh. comes with your AVR or you have to buy. Or you you can buy you don't have to you you can buy like an Odyssey calibrated microphone for like eighty bucks. Um, oh, I didn't realize that. It, yeah, it all goes through the AVR. I'm curious, um, honestly, believe it or not, this is gonna be a surprise to most people. You can use the little Odyssey Eiffel Tower microphone if you don't have a U mic. Uh, obsessive compulsive audio file has a video on how to get the calibration file for that mic that you have um and within like it may be a db or two off from like what you might get with a like a 120 dollars microphone mm -hmm. but if you want to like just have something to measure your speakers with you can actually use that mic with rew plug it into your computer it's it surprised me um that you could do that yeah. so for people that don't have access to that it's a cool thing um but sure but sure i don't know what i'm saying now i just went <laughs> no um you know what but do yeah. you what do you think about uh because somebody mentioned is this is actually quite a bit up here i should yeah sorry i talk it. too much um i mean honestly i think a lot of these people are just having a conversation amongst themselves yeah but, which is great Yes. More power to you, P. 
people. I will say, my, Michael, <laughs> real quick, where you look for that, Michael says, Joel, everyone seems to like the Odyssey one. I'm going to wait for Magic Beans. So, uh, Michael, what I'll say, I mentioned this earlier. I think you were here. Maybe not. Um, Odyssey one is awesome. It's super, like, if you already have an Odyssey calibration, like an EQ file on your phone or your iPad, and you know how to transfer it to your computer and back, I think, am I thinking of the right one? I think so, yeah. I'm getting confused because I did the Supreme Audio, audio uh, <laughs> Odyssey calibration. Like, I think, well, I like, with time, yeah, because, yeah, like, the Odyssey one is just, a, like, an HTML script with, like, the Supreme Audio calibration. You have to go in and edit the... Uh, the ADY file in a JSON editor, like a JSON, and you can go yeah. in there and do all sorts of things. It's, um, yeah, it's cool. But um, yeah, Odyssey one, if you already have that Odyssey file, it literally is a few clicks and like you're done. It 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 works so well um, outside of uh, you know not correcting anything above 300 hertz. That's mm -hmm. that's the biggest gotcha. So sorry, right. go ahead. Okay, just simple comment. AV10, the Marantz AV10. Is that a robot? <laughs> Bleep, blop, blurp, Marantz. Um, so yeah, that's the that's their flagship preamp. That's uh, seven thousand um, so, dollars. But I mean, it, it literally has everything. Um, it's a fifteen point four channel preamp. But obviously, because it's a preamp, you have to have it. You have to have all of your speakers powered by external amps. Um, but I mean, it's got RO3D. Uh, you can, uh, you know, obviously Dolby Atmos and DTSX, IMAX enhanced. Um, just the fact that you can have up to a 15.4 configuration is bananas. Um, it's got, you know, Marantz's HDAM. Oh, wait, no, it doesn't because it's a preamp. Sorry, never mind. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it pretty much has every bell and whistle you could think of. Um, but would you pay $7,000? Hell no. Or something like that. I probably, no, I mean, you know, the, the diminishing return there is real. Like it, it mm -hmm. what's it going to do for seven grand that like something for like, okay, say I don't need the, the extra channels, right? That's, that's like a big thing. It's like, why am I paying for this with something I'll never use? Mm -hmm. I, I like, it's really hard as like, you know, I mentioned this in a video. It's like growing up like poor, like not having a lot of money. Um, still not having a lot of disposable income, but like enough to like be able to like live comfortably and buy stuff that, you know, we want, um, that we need. It's a lot of, like, I look at like, I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to tour some really high end home theaters that million dollar star Wars theater. Right. Um, there's another theater like in, in, uh, Palm Harbor, Palm Harbor. Was it? I think recently there's like another, like, million dollar home theater basically and and mm -hmm. you know all these guys have like wisdom audio systems with like their speakers are like you know i don't remember it's like something like 15 grand a piece like you know and honestly did i hear fifteen thousand dollar speakers yes i did did i feel like i was hearing fifteen thousand dollars per speaker no not at all <laughs> it's, not, it's not fine um not so to, what not, would fifteen thousand dollars sound to you? Not that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it would really have to like blow my like blow my socks off. And I, you know what? Maybe maybe part of it is me and my hearing loss. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like, it's really hard for me to go from like listening to like my speakers to like that and go like that's totally worth fifteen grand. You know, I can't like even for a like a whole system, like one speaker is like the price of my entire home theater, pretty much mm -hmm. like, you know, it's crazy. And I'm like, Oh, and you know, like they only had like one of the, one of the theaters, they only had like two subs in. I'm like, really? You spent all this money and you only get two subs and like the ports were chuffing. And I was like, this can't be like, are you guys serious? But, um, <laughs> I was like, no way. So yeah, I don't, 
I, I honestly don't know that I can answer what $15,000 speakers would sound like, but I really feel like even if I had bukoodles of money and like money was no issue, mm -hmm. I honestly don't know that I would spend 15 grand on a pair of speaker or on a, on a single speaker, you know, I don't even like maybe, maybe five per speaker is kind of like my max. Cause I've always been more about like the setup and everything too. Like I, yeah. I feel like after you like, diminishing returns right after that point you do get into aesthetics you know yes. more you get into material quality like you know so if that's important to you and you're like i want longevity it's like okay well then maybe you consider this but mm -hmm. you know going to these trade shows like florida audio expo which is predominantly like a two channel yeah uh trade show very cool to see all this stuff but when i'm listening to a pair of seventeen thousand dollars speakers i just i'm like wow they sound good i'm never gonna have these in my <laughs> house you know like i would never i would never think you know what i got 17 grand laying around i want a pair of these that's not for me and that's not to rag on anybody that likes that stuff but it's just it really for me it's hard to to justify that because like as much of an audiophile that i am I'm also not a two channel guy at all. I don't sit and listen to records or vinyl or any, not again, vinyl is super cool. I love vinyl. Yeah. Xavier was a guy I met recently with Gene De La Sala when I did the maximum AV um, shoot. I also met him at Florida Audio Expo. He's like, they call him Captain Analog because he like literally set up, and, er, set up, sets up and calibrates turntables like Michelle, like high end wow. turntables that, I mean, it is literally an art and it like completely fascinates me. So I need to, he actually reached out to me and, and invited me over to like check out some of the stuff. And I'm, oh, cool. Yeah. I think it'd be cool because it's like something I'm not really familiar with. Yeah. But I, I need to kind of keep my distance because I'm like, I already have too many expensive hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> and if I got, start to get into turntables or something and two channel, um, because I'm just not a two channel guy. So it's like, spending all this money man it's like mm -hmm. why am i gonna spend like there were there were cables at florida audio expo that are like 30 or forty thousand dollars and it's like so dumb someone mentioned the placebo um yeah like like it, it is very real uh i can't i'm just trying to find the I think it was Michael. Yeah, I'm pretty new to this place. Placebo, placebo is crazy real. And I always share, I think I've shared this story before. I had a friend who bought a Kaleidoscape system, kind of new to Kaleidoscape, uh, which is like, again, the entry point cost is like this, the price of my entire home theater. It's completely, for <laughs> yeah. someone like me, completely like out of my price range and will be probably for, unless they do something and, and try to compete like if apple ever comes out with like a way to download high res files onto a hard drive or something mm -hmm. kaleidoscape's gonna have to do something to compete with that because apple's the one area that can like i feel like if they did that they would change the whole industry they, they yeah. really have that kind of power yes. um but no so like he gets a kaleidoscape and we're talking you know and he's like oh yeah the movies just all look better and i was like all right i mean he's not a video file he's not an audio file but hmm. i was like okay that's definitely like a little placebo because like a bit rate will only do so much it's not gonna like visually change much of the the makeup of a movie right unless the hmm. encode on the the 4k blu-ray is already really bad or something hmm. it'd be different if it was like oh we got this sh like shitty terminator 2 master on blu-ray or 4k <laughs> blu-ray but they did a complete like like 30 like new like film scan for kaleidoscape all right then i i would sure. understand that but um that's not what we're seeing here we're just basically mainly seeing like an increase in overall bit rate most of the time um and sometimes not really a lot or any at all um but he's like yeah the picture looks better but he's like man i gotta tell you the audio is like a million times better than what's on the disc all right right there my red flag my bs meter was going off because i was like yeah um, again unless they're doing remixes they're getting the same because he was like it, he kept going back to saying oh it's lossless it's lossless and i'm like it's uncompressed no he said it's uncompressed 
and I'm like, okay, but lossless once unzipped is uncompressed. Like it, mm-hmm. what, like Dolby Atmos on the disc, uncompressed. Like once you feed it through, it's the same signal. I was like, you're not getting, because there is no such thing as like uncompressed Atmos, right? It's there's no like linear PCM Atmos. It's all like you know, Dolby Atmos got to be decoded by the receiver. That's how it works. Yeah, and I was just I would call bullshit on that because i was like yeah dude there's no way like yeah they're they're probably i was like i (laughs) doubt that they're getting a separate mix unless unless they're getting the theatrical mix from the mezzanine file from these studios yeah and then they're the master or something yeah and then they're doing their own their own like kind of folder like encoding to dolby atmos but i don't think they are i think they're literally yeah they're getting the mezzanine video file, but they get the same like lost like the Dolby Atmos track that the the Blu-ray or whatever would get. I mean, I would I would in a heartbeat invest in Kaleidoscape if I knew that they were receiving like actual master files from the post production facilities, both video and audio. If that was the case, I'd be like, whoa that's cool i mean i can kind of see how video might be improved because a lot of the video files or just the the downloadable file alone that you get from kaleidoscape is twice or three times as big as what it is on the 4k blu-ray disc so i can get you know maybe having that extra information presents itself on your screen as well but obviously i haven't seen it in person so i can't attest to that but but yeah i mean it, yeah I don't, I don't believe kaleidoscape has some like relationship with all these you know s- you know film studios and post-production yeah. facilities where they're yeah. getting some secret version that you can only get on kaleidoscape and nowhere else i don't believe that yeah so. yeah and jed actually mentioned something he's like probably more of a difference between Blu- blu-ray and streaming than blu-ray and kaleidoscape and you're 100 percent correct because what i noticed like when kaleidoscape first came out they were big into kind of not big into but they were more comparing themselves to we have better quality than what's on the disc right mm-hmm. but they quickly pivoted that to we have better quality than what's on streaming <laughs> right yeah. you want the best you're gonna like you want kaleidoscape when it comes to like streaming and honestly it's not streaming you're downloading this file to a hard drive and playing it back so it's not streaming but i get where they're coming from and i think they had to pivot that because they were getting so much like kind of backlash from like well okay why is it so much more expensive than just buying a 4k player and then buying the disc mm-hmm. like i'm not getting like what am i getting literally we're if we're talking about diminishing returns if there's an improvement over the disc it's in like maybe the the maximum maybe five percent on the visuals audio wise mm-hmm. probably zero yep. like you're getting maybe yep. and i would say zero to five percent it's probably closer to like maybe one to two percent uh if that like less compression artifacts right because of the higher bit rate other than that I guarantee you in motion you highly you'd be you'd be like it'd be really hard to spot the difference between the two yeah. um i mean know, it I just think... seems like you know if you're going to charge a premium on convenience alone why are you charging that much more right Cause I mean, that that's really all it comes down to is convenience. Yeah. Instead of having to get up, put a disc in a drive, then go back down and sit down and then press play, whatever. I get it how you can have this entire library at your fingertips, yeah. choose what you want, download it and have it on your you know, server multi terabyte yeah. server yeah yeah i get it it's basically marrying s- the convenience of streaming with the performance and quality of 
uncompressed and lossless, et cetera. So yeah. I get that. But how do you justify charging that much more just for the convenience factor? It, it really doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And yes, uh, Chana is in the house. Uh, Techno Dad, hey. yes, we are talking about Kaleidoscape um, and diminishing returns. That's the whole point of this like podcast live stream thing. Yeah. Um, Justin actually mentions something too. If you don't mind the work, a disc ripped into a NAS, NAS would be so much cheaper. I assume the quality would be the same too, no? Yeah, as long as you're ripping them into like an MKV where there's no additional compression, like you're just ripping the movie yeah. and audio track and maybe some subtitles. It's, it's going to be bit for bit identical to what's on the disc. You're just changing the container. Um, yeah. But I, I like how he opened it, though. He's like, if you don't mind the work, because it is work. It is. is it, it can be tedious for some people. Other people, it's like, you know, it's literally like making their coffee in the morning. It doesn't matter. Like, it's just a, a process they enjoy or they don't mind. I, I rip all my own discs, but, you know... I'm more into like the tech side of things. That's why I spend eight to nine hours doing manual calibrations. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like right. that that's a walk in the park, like ripping a disc compared to to doing something like that. So um I also like making my own demo files where I like will use like MKV tool nicks and and like basically set the in and out points of where I want it to start and just create those little clips and put them on my my plex server and play those back so i'm not having to grab discs <laughs> wow grab discs every time <laughs> i uh <laughs> freudian slip there um but uh i'm not having to grab the disc every time i want to demo a scene when i'm testing out subs or speakers or whatever so it's, yeah. it can be very convenient um and then to go back justin i did see your comment and i know you're talking i know what you're talking about um he says, I know the, the new room tour upgrades video is coming, but the weight is killing me. Um, I didn't see your other, I don't know if you posted before, but I'm pretty sure you're talking about the updated tutorials. They are coming. The whole point of me doing the room update is to make those tutorials so much easier to shoot because having the limited space I did before. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it just, I kept, I kept hitting roadblock after roadblock with that. Um, do you remember like the first couple of things we did? Like most people were asking about those. Like, when are they coming? When are they coming? The whole stream was just people like, when's a new tutorial? I'm like, it's good, yeah. I promise. I, I have not forgotten about you guys. Thank you. Thank you for your support and like sticking yeah. around. This is um, this is episode seven and we took last week off. So it's been two months since we started this podcast. That's crazy. So. It's crazy. Time flies. Um, that hurts does, does mention though, and while uh, Technodad does mention that they call a Kaleidoscape a luxury product, a luxury product that does not have Dolby Vision to me is is like, huh? <laughs> like you're paying so much money that I feel like that, and I don't know if they just don't want to pay the Dolby license fee or if there's some other like reason for that. But to me, it's kind of like spending, and I know I'm, I you know I might get shit for this from some people, but it's like. <laughs> I, I, every time I see someone recommend a Samsung display to me, I'm like, well, it doesn't have Dolby Vision. And if I'm paying a certain amount of money, I just, I want that as an option. Come on, Samsung. Like, you can make so much more money if you just add that. Yeah. Just do it. Like, it's, like, there's no reason to leave out features at that price point anymore, right? Like, mm -hmm. just give me everything. That's what I want. Yeah. Um, and for some people, that's not going to be, a, like, that's not going to matter. For me, it does. So I'm one of those people. I mean, even go back to the Marantz AV10, the fact that you still have to buy that extra $200 direct live license is a joke. If you're yeah. spending $7,000, give me direct, give me all the direct, li direct live, direct bass control, multi bass control, all of it. Because yeah. I'm spending $7,000 on your product. You better give me all of the versions of direct free yeah yeah so it's for real it's pretty and dumb. and uh techno dad does mention that uh, most projectors don't have dv support which a kaleidoscape system predominantly is going to go into a system that is has projection and like he said most projectors don't have dv support um yeah and he also 
he's totally on the page if it's not worth it for the majority of people. And I think that even Collide Escape knows that. They're not, they're not yeah. from like, like I actually had someone or some from Collide Escape reach out to me and say, mm -hmm. would you like to make a video on this? And I was like, I don't really think this is what my channel is about right now. Like uh, I'm, I'm more of a budget, like friendly <laughs> DIY thing. And it's like when your system costs this much money, I just don't think that it's a good fit right now. Um, so nothing again, the, the people that I've met from Collide Escape have been super cool. Um, sure. They tried to hire me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for doing their quality control monitoring or something, but I didn't want to move to California. So, wait, they really did? Um, they kind of talked to me about it um, a little bit uh, when I went to the first CDO, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't really pursue it because it was just like we just bought our house. And I'm like, the 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 pet. It, yeah, I don't want to get into it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you and I can talk about it privately. Um, but yeah so going back to like the whole diminishing returns thing so we talked about speakers avrs um displays and projectors are another major a major it can, it can be a money pit for sure once yeah. you start getting into like the higher end jvcs i mean the it seems like every year like the biggest feature or yeah quality upgrade with TVs in particular is brightness. Right. I mean, how I particularly don't like, especially like with my, with my phone, the brightness, I don't know if you can see this, the brightness is set to like a third of the way up. Yeah. This right here. Do you because have a, I, do you have night mode on too? I do. Yeah. I could tell. It looks yellow, huh? Yeah, it's got jaundice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> phone has jaundice. <laughs> yeah. This is my jaundice iPhone. Yes. Um, but uh, but I mean, yeah, it's like I, I don't particularly like overly bright things. I it mm, just yeah, it, it it wears down my eyes quicker than I would like. So if TVs are just trying to get brighter and brighter and brighter, I don't know if that's the direction I want them to be well, heading. I think, I, I think once we like, so there's a whole, like kind of like the brightness war, we'll call it brightness <laughs> wars or whatever, right? Yeah, right. TVs was like, I want to get brighter. So there's two sides to that though. There are applications where like you're putting a display in a bright room where you need extra brightness to like combat that, right? Like you can't expect to like, if you're like, let's say you just, you're like got to pay a professional to calibrate it and they're like, this is what the studio environment's like. I'm going to calibrate to 100 nits for standard dynamic range. Guess what? It's going to be super dim in a bright room. Heck, even in a dark room, if you're not used to it, it's going to look dim. Mm -hmm. But if you, like, say, you have a super bright room and you're like, you have this extra overhead to calibrate to, say, 300 nits, well, now, like, you're going to be able to see way more of the picture. And it's still going to be accurate to the source except you're boosting the brightness because you're trying to combat the room. You're not, you're not going for a reference viewing environment here. You're trying to say, Hey, this is what, this is where I view the movie sometimes. And that's why mm. you might have a day in a night mode on the TV. Yeah. Um, but the other side to that is the more brightness for HDR is especially like on an OLED is a good thing. Um, but we will reach a point. Like I always say, like, I want to stop, at the point where we start to need sunglasses when we watch a movie, right? <laughs> right? Like the HDR, like for stuff like, you know, little particles or maybe the glint off of a sword or something, that's, that's fine. But I, sure. like when I, when I'm driving around, like I always hear the argument of like, well, you know, the, like if you go outside on a sunny day, it's like over 10,000 hits or something like that. And I'm like, yeah. And I wear sunglasses and I don't want that experience when I watch a movie. Right. <laughs> but I don't know that we'll actually get to that point. I think yeah. uh, the way content is, is mastered anyway um, in HDR and Dolby vision. I think that we're, we're like, even when we reach these 10,000 nit uh, displays, eventually, um, uh, they're predominantly going to be used for those peak highlights and they're really not going to be taking up much of the screen. Although if filmmakers start using fade to white screens that are like a hundred percent values, 
I'm going to kill him. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's only so many lens flares I can handle JJ Abrams at 10,000 nits. Okay. <laughs> I can't take right. it. Um, so yeah, that, that's the only thing I will say. And you'll notice that too. Like, I don't know, I, can't, I don't know what phone you have, but like if it supports like HDR on YouTube, you can watch HDR videos and you'll see the, the display kind of change. Like suddenly like the whites in the comment section, if you ha don't have it in dark mode or like, like the white bars and stuff are kind of dimmed down, but like the actual like content is like, it looks yeah. different. Like it's more punchy. It's like, it has that HDR look to it. Um, excuse me. Yeah. I think like more brightness for HDR is a good thing, but they're, they're like having like, unlit, like a crazy amount of brightness for like SDR content just to like have it pumped up is like, crazy to me like you really like anything over like a thousand nits there even then like unless you have the display like out in the sun and we're talking like you know you go to like a drive through and like they have the displays those those might need to be pumped up because they're sure under the sun and they're a business you know but you're not yeah. you can't imagine watching content like that no yikes Yikes. Or, or watching content in, with the same settings as you see when you walk into Costco or Best Buy. <laughs> I want all it's... my grass to look like a nuclear fallout type of thing. It's like bright <laughs> yeah. greenish, like uh, yellow, and contrast yeah. is boosted. Everything is oh. just to eleven. <laughs> yeah, and they do that look at me. The, yeah, they sell you the TV, and then you get it home, and you're like, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's like when you. Oh God! It's like you know you you end up falling asleep like this, and the next day you go to work and you're like close encounters of the third kind, <laughs> and it's like half side of your face is all sunburnt. <laughs> oh, shaping mountains huh? out of mashed potatoes. Um, <laughs> but um, okay, but yeah, so so here's a question. Sure, I might have an answer. Uh. How could you possibly justify the price of a uh, an altitude sixteen from Trinoff? Um, I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna only ask me easy questions tonight, Elon. We talked <laughs> about this before. Um, how could I justify the price? Because what? Uh, it's the, like the eighteen grand or yeah, something. Um, the short answer, I couldn't. I, I like currently I couldn't. Like I don't have a room capable. One, you need a like, you need a bigger room, really, if you're trying to fill that room with sixteen speakers. You're not gonna put it in a yeah. eleven by twelve room, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's my ultimate goal is to have a nine dot four dot six. That's yeah. like my end personal end game configuration. Um, so just, want, because, are, the, just because, just because my my, you know. my end game is also going to have a projector screen. Okay. So I'm going to have the front left, front center, uh, yeah, front left. Are you doing center, front wides? Uh, you do front yeah. wides for the okay. yes, because because I want to have my LCR behind the screen. Mm, so, so I you, want okay. I want the front wides to fill in the gap between the screen and the surrounds, right? So that's why I want nine ear level speakers and I want six heights because that's the most immersive you can possibly get having speakers above you and in front of you and behind you. Yes. So, um, but I can achieve that with the Marantz AV10 or the, what is How it? The, An the Anthem AVM 90 or whatever, you know? Yeah. How big and those are, room? you know, six grand, seven grand. Yeah, it's thirteen. No, it's sixteen feet long and eleven feet wide. Okay, okay. but the, yeah, but I'm not talking about I'm not talking about that current theater. Oh, okay. uh, just because okay. my my brother in law is probably going to sell this place or rent it out uh, within maybe a year or so. What? I'll buy so it. I'm going to have to move my theater to our property. Yeah, but my ultimate end game theater is 9.4.6 which i can achieve with a marantz av10 or 
uh, an Anthem AVM 90. Um, but I mean, I guess, but, but the thing is a 9.4.6 configuration can easily be attained with an AV10. The thing about the trin off is that it can handle up to 16 channels, but you literally don't have you like, like there's, there's nothing assigned to a specific speaker terminal. It is, everything is just fair, like just free, free. Yeah. You free can put ride, the speaker there and the basically yeah, assign there's no, it to the Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing that says this has to be front, left, center, front, right. 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 It's just, here's 16 outputs. Do what you want with them. Yeah. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. I really like that aspect, how it's completely customizable to however right. you want. I mean, for the price, it definitely should be, right? Like, it's, you know, right. that, that kind of par for the course there. Yeah. Yeah. And their room correction, which obviously is built in to the preamp itself, their room correction is like direct live on steroids pretty much yeah. um so it's it's basically taking again charging a premium for convenience it is taking something ultra premium but allowing almost anybody to achieve an incredible sounding system um because it, it just has these crazy algorithms going on and calculations happening to where a general consumer, although I think you can actually like hire somebody or like have an actual trend off technician come out to your place yeah. if you really want to and have them calibrate it, which is insane. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of built into the price, I guess. But even with that being said, with all those bells and whistles and with the convenience factor and room correction that is leagues ahead of Direct Live, supposedly, I'm thinking $10,000 max, right? Yeah. Considering that the AV10 and the Anthem AVM90 are six grand, seven grand. So... I can justify having a trend off level, whatever doing. Yeah. Be, being around, around 10 grand. That to me sounds like a price that I could potentially get behind if, and when I ever think that I can afford something like that. Yeah. But 18 grand. No, man. Yeah. That's hard. No, that's hard. When it, when it gets to, like a uh, uh, buying a car or choosing <laughs> right. a preamp that's where i'm going to tap out but if it's if it's 10 grand or less if push comes to shove i might be able to swing that if we win the lottery or you know or like right, right. or i saved up for many many years and finally i can afford a trend off if it was $10,000 yeah but 18 i don't think i'll ever be but able you to get justify this, that you get this cool microphone though like this is like michael had mentioned have you seen the microphone and yeah it dude it's super cool it um is. It really what is. i what what like looking at it it it's like their calibration also looks at like the time domain um i don't know if it does what arc does or like phase aligns or direct also does that hmm. uh it will actually like i know dirac will like actually change the impulse response of certain speakers i believe yeah. um so yeah i don't know if it does that but i, I would hope that it, it, this kind of would do everything like under the under the sun right to yeah because like for that amount of money uh, but yeah you can't i do know you can uh pay someone to bring you know, like to come in and calibrate your system for you with this yeah um if Trinoff offered their preamp and their amps and like Trinoff 
manufactured speakers, if they had their own speaker line, so if you got preamp, amps, and speakers for yeah. eight for eighteen thousand dollars, then I think that would be valuable. Um, that would probably be worth the price of admission. Um, but just a preamp being eighteen grand, no way, man, no way. Yeah, oh, they do correct for phase. I just looked at. I literally scrolled oh, down do. one one more, and it was like phase correction. I'm like, Ding. before and after, yeah. Um, and you know, this is stuff that it can also be done, obviously, manually, most of the time. Yeah. But it requires a lot more work on your part most of the time. Yes. Um, that it, I, it yeah, and honestly, or, or you could hire someone that would potentially be able to do that for you. But again, you're, you're going to pay for it. So yeah, either way. you know, again, diminishing returns, right? Uh, I think that most people um, don't consider hiring a professional calibrator, uh, which is their prerogative, right? Like it doesn't, mm -hmm. like for me, it's kind of like, I may get the, my display professionally calibrated at some point this year. Cause I know a guy like who works for ISF, like Jason Dustel. Um, he's local to Florida. Um, and so we've been talking about like maybe doing a video or something or a series of videos. So I might get a calibration out of it. I don't know. I'm not saying I will, but to me, that's important. I, I like getting the most out of your display. I've calibrated it myself, but like, I don't have a $15,000 like spectra radiometer, you know, that he has, like, I don't have these tools that, you know, yeah, you Mike one is fantastic. It is a cheap, um, all, like, measurement microphone that will that allows you to kind of dial everything in the best that you can but there does exist higher quality things out there of like from professional audio calibrators yeah. will it again diminishing returns you know are you are you gonna get more money or like more enjoyment or more performance out of paying someone like i you know i don't know what professional calibrators charge but let's say two grand if you're calibrating a massive system yeah i don't know but that guy's time and knowledge and experience in the field is also worth something you know it's like you're For not sure. having to do it so that's the other side to that yeah. so um you know if you want the best you kind of have to decide do i want to try to get this myself and do all this myself diy mm -hmm. the the diy route or do i want to pay someone to do it um yeah, sorry, that went like a little off topic there, but it kind of does fall into like how I kind of view the hobby in that like I'm more of a hands-on kind of guy. I want to I want to learn how to do this so this professional guy doesn't have to come back and I could just do it myself. Even yeah. Even if it might take me 10 hours in a day, I'll do, I'll, I'll do it knowing that it was done right and I'll get the enjoyment out of doing it. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that time or really the drive to want to do that, you know? Yeah. And so I'm different than other people, which, which is fine. And I find value in doing that, but I also do find value and respect the people that do it for a living, you know? And if I'm ever mm -hmm. in a position where I need to pay someone, I know like, you know, you gotta get the, the, the right guy, the good guy or the, the woman, whoever. And, you know, I'm more than happy to pay them for their services knowing that I'm getting the best out of my system if i didn't have the time to do that i would probably still want to be there to kind of ask questions and be like hey like you know i've done this before is it kind of like this are you doing blah 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 you know but mm -hmm. not so much where i'm like in their way it's kind of like you know when the ac guys come to service your ac and you're you're like well i did this and this and you just hang around and tell them everything you did you're like okay now you're being a helicopter customer <laughs> go away let them do their thing yeah you yeah. know ask questions at the end if you have questions mm -hmm. um but yeah so i guess you've asked all the questions so far i thought i had one for you but i don't <laughs> well um what's life what's so it mean? let's see so can we well, if if we bring storm audio and turn off into the picture, mm -hmm. so can we end this topic by saying 
maybe the AVM 90 from Anthem with their Arc Genesis and the AV10 from Marantz. Is that the apex of the bell curve? Is I that think the... Yeah, I think someone said it in here. I, it was way earlier on, but it's like, it's kind of a sliding curve depending right. on what you're looking at. So like if someone's looking at a Trinov or Storm, then yeah, like these other things like what you mentioned, the AVM90 and stuff might actually be affordable by comparison to those, mm -hmm. right? Like when you slide that curve, it's like if we're, you know, but also the curve goes down too. So like if you're looking at like a $1,800 receiver and then you go, okay, well, could I get like a, you know, thousand dollar receiver that will do the same thing maybe yeah i don't know like it's yeah. that's a hard you know normally when you start sliding that curve down the features that you may be looking at on those higher end devices start dropping too like they're they're you're not you're no longer getting the channel count you want you're no longer getting this you're no longer getting that so yeah. customization blah 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 you might even like you know some some people don't want to they don't like the the visual aspect of something so automatically they're going to go to the higher one because you know those offer a certain visual aesthetic right yeah some people love the way marantz products look mm -hmm. i'm indifferent like, i don't really care <laughs> you yeah. know like i yeah, i was yeah. like i kind of personally don't like the little circular like thing on the front right right that's a staple really, of theirs yeah it is it is and some people like that I honestly, I'm not a big fan, but at the end of the day, I don't really care because I, right. <laughs> I turn my front display off when I'm watching a movie. Yeah, just so it's not or, in your face and yeah. bright. And, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think if you're looking at those Storm Audio Trinov products already, then your then your bell curve is already way up here, right? Yeah. Like it, you're you're not in the same percentile as like someone who is kind of more in the mid range mm -hmm. i was gonna stop at mid be one of the cool kids it's so mid bro <laughs> no you're not you're like way ab like above that i don't like the term end game product because I, I feel mm -hmm. like there's always going to be some new end game product out you know there's gonna be a new end game receiver there's gonna be new end game speakers gonna be, it's like you just it's just like a buzzword i don't really yeah yeah just give it care. time and something else will... something else will be yeah, yeah. I, I you know i think when we start putting monetary values on things right it it is you know we we tend to see the value when someone says that thing costs a million dollars whoa what that's crazy i don't like that either really because it's like what does a million dollars get you yeah. you know when someone says it's a million dollar theater well honestly most of that money went into the construction of the room if it's you know that's, uh -huh. that's it like right <laughs> so it's like how much i mean i've seen million dollar home theaters that literally have a ten thousand dollar projector wow to me there's like there's a there's a balance there that is, that was not met you <laughs> right. know so um the thing yeah. is, a lot of the theaters have seen like that. It's normally through an integrator. Nothing against mm -hmm. integrators whatsoever, but their job is to sell a system, and they do a good they do a good job of that. But I've I've met a lot of people through this, and they have a passion for the hobby, but they're not they're not I'm trying to figure out how to say this without coming. You know, I I think you guys know what I'm saying, but like. Me, I'm like, it, like in there, like hooking stuff up myself, and saying most of these, most of these guys aren't doing that, and so yeah. like, I have a friend actually. I can talk about this personally because like he's a good friend of mine, but like he's never like really he. All of his home theater stuff is custom through like an integrator, like an integrator, and so he's yeah. never hooked up mo most of his components himself. Yeah. Unless it's like, oh, I bought a new PC or I did this and like I put it in the rack or whatever. Okay. But like I went to try to help him with the mini DSP and he didn't know where things needed to be hooked up because he wasn't familiar with the wiring. 
Right. So there, you know, there's many different levels and there's no like right or wrong here. It's just like, you know, I'm one of those people that like, I want to know every component. I want to know what gets hooked up to what. And I want to, you know, I'm that kind of guy. Not everybody's like that. So, yeah. um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was kind of going with that point, but I lost <laughs> it somewhere in the middle. Um, but yeah, I guess my point is that, you know, not everyone is going to be on the same level. I just hid myself. I hid that whole screen there. I didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah, not everyone is, is in the same level of like enthusiast, right? Like we're like, I'm an sure. enthusiast, but there are people that want like an amazing theater, but they don't really, maybe they don't have the time or they just don't really want to, to spend the time learning about it to to do it all themselves or to have more of a hand in it and that's okay like there's nothing wrong with that um it it does kind of like you know is <laughs> i guess someone who can't afford everything that they want it it kind of like i look at it and i'm like man i, I like he doesn't even like th this person doesn't even know what this thing is called it's like damn <laughs> you know it's kind of it's it's a little like i don't want to say disappointing but it's kind of like uh okay like you know i could see where this person's like priorities lie right like they're more into like sure. the aesthetics or something and again i'm not i'm not really saying anything negative here i'm just i'm in a different part of the kind of like my brain is kind of a different part of the hobby with like ocd and stuff that i want to mm -hmm. know every like little intricate detail and then other people are just like I just want to turn the damn thing on and enjoy a movie. Yeah. And I think both of those completely valid, right? Mm hmm So. Yeah, I personally think, I mean, uh, going back again to trend off versus, you know, Morant's AV10 or whatever. Um, if, you, if, if you have a dedicated home theater space, like in its own room or whatever, um, I personally think if you have one couch or just one one little plane of where you're going to be sitting and where your main listening position will be i think the biggest that you will ever need to go is 9.x.6 yeah um because like i said you know if you've got a projector your lcr is behind the screen your front wides cover the distance between the screen and the surrounds. If you got your surrounds, surround backs, six heights, it just makes sense. Yeah. But the fact that the Trinoff, the Altitude 16, for example, the fact that it only supports 16 channels, um, kind of, I don't like that. Um, I, would, I would assume anything that is going to cost $18,000 is going to be more geared towards people with multiple rows of seats. Um, because in that instance, you're probably going to want two sets of side surrounds so that each row is basically getting their own, you know, copy of the right. side surround information, which you can assign in a trend off. Um, you can't really do that, uh, with, you know, Morantz or anything. It, it's not as customizable that way. So, yeah, uh, just to speak on that real quick though, um, yeah. this, uh, a friend of mine, the same friend that I was talking about earlier, earlier, um, there does exist outside technologies. We'll say that extra, like, like think of like a mini DSP. That goes in between your speakers and subwoofers right you mm -hmm. you literally have one output and then you could multiply that output by four you could uh, assign you know delays to that or whatever so he has the avm 90 he's the same guy that i bought my uh 6300h from or avm 70 i'm sorry he upgraded to the a avm 70 but he had always wanted dual like extra like basically another pair of side surround speakers because of his rows of seating like there was kind of a void, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to do that, 
he needed to add uh, something called the Ashley Proteas, which are basically like mini DS. Think of like mini DSPs for your speakers. Mm -hmm. Now, these were actually recommended to him by Anthony Grimani. Um, they're not cheap. Um, they use yeah. something called Phoenix connectors. Um, right. So, uh, but basically he was able to add those. And the whole point was he was going to have Anthony Grimani come out and do a full system calibration. Well, um, yeah. Uh, which he told me how much that he wanted. I don't know. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> but, well, I mean, it's uh, Anthony Grimani. So. Yeah. But what's cool is, uh, I'd actually got the opportunity to kind of, uh, we were talking on the phone, uh, one day and he's like, well, why don't you just like remote into my, my system, like through team viewer or whatever. And like, you can check out the proteas. And I was like, dude, I would have a field day calibrating this system. Like it, it would be a <laughs> Like if I had this functionality here, it would just make the whole process so simple. Like you had every control you could think of right there. You wouldn't even need, um, if you had your subwoofers hooked up to these, you wouldn't need a mini DSP or anything like that. Like it's everything is built in. But what was cool was he could take the like basically the pre outs from his receiver into the input and then he could assign like you were talking about with the trend off, he could assign that to any one of the outputs on the other side. So yeah, in the case of like the side surrounds, he was able to take that input and say, okay, go to this speaker and then this speaker and then this so he was able to have those side surrounds kind of doubled on the second row yeah really easily just by a couple of button presses right and i was like that's super cool so he was able to change on the fly where he wanted things routed which mm. i mean is a huge benefit but then it also had like i think i can't remember how many bands of parametric eq it had on each channel um but yeah, having something like REW and just being able to create those filters like that, doing like, you know, you could average the whole listening area or whatever. I was like, dude, then I looked at how much he spent for those. And I was like, it's like a third of the price of my home theater. I'm like, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. But it gave me ideas for the future of like, you know, mm -hmm. making it easier and more accessible for doing stuff like that. So, um, Kevin actually had a cool comment here. Um, says Brad writing a check for a home theater to a rich guy is just bling DIY home theater, a dollar at a time is passion for the hobby. Glad you're passionate. Yeah. I think I'm definitely passionate and sometimes that gets mm -hmm. in the way of enjoying stuff. Um, you know, you see, and I think I, I never try to be judgmental of someone else, you know, cause I'm not about that. I'm about like, there's, there's multiple tiers to this hobby. Um, yeah. You know, and like my way of doing something isn't maybe necessarily the right way for somebody else. And that's okay. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it can be sometimes discouraging when you see a really nice theater and the person just has it because they have money, you know. And I, thankfully, I've never actually yeah. experienced, I haven't experienced that particular thing in the home theaters I've toured with Michael. Thankfully, they've all been really passionate. Charlie, the guy in Louisiana oh, cool. that has a Stone, Star Wars theater. Um, he knew everything that he had, um, and he was actually, he had his own, uh, he had retired from his own uh, production company. Oh, like wow. He did movies and commercials. So we talked a lot about cameras and lighting and stuff because I'm a film film nerd and a film. I went to film school and all that stuff. And so we connected that way. Um, and it was cool to see like him have the same kind of passions that I do. Um, and the same type, you know, same type of hobbies and stuff. Uh, but I still realize I'm like way more in, <laughs> into this than, than even though he's really into it. I'm like, yeah. on another, like I've gone down the rabbit hole, man. I followed Alice down the rabbit. <laughs> like I'm gone. Like I can't, there's no coming out like, uh, from that for this, for this guy here. But, yeah. um, but yeah, I, you know, and, and the one guy in Cape Coral, Mike, he built all the speakers themselves wow himself himself uh i mean he obviously got like the boxes and stuff but like he mm -hmm. he made them he made the subwoofers and he uh he did all i think he did all the wiring because he's like an like he was like a electrical engineer or something oh dang so like he wow. like had his hand like and i to me i was like that would be me like i would want my hands yeah. and 
You know, it's like, I want to like, I want to put all the components in the rack. I want to do all the wire management. He did all the wire management too. He's like, yeah, it took me two days to do <laughs> oh all. And it, dude, it was like one of the cleanest, <laughs> the cleanest wire management jobs I've ever seen. I'm like, yeah. oh man, that's super, super awesome. So to see guys like that, you know, um, but it, I'm sure, you know, uh, like I said, all the people that I've met through Michael and seen those tours have not followed that trend of like well they just have money you know mm -hmm. they're all passionate about it some more than others and that's to be expected i mean you know, this sure. is a vast hobby um so yeah it was a uh, super cool super cool well that's good yes yeah because i'm sure you know 30 seconds after meeting somebody who isn't passionate about it and they just threw money at somebody to make a really good home theater yeah it would just it'd probably be a, a boring conversation <laughs> yeah no for sure you know? just yeah. like look look what look other what the, people did yeah you know? yeah he did he helped charlie helped design that star wars theater too like he oh cool that yeah and his son like helped him design it as well which was super cool so yeah. super nice um so I guess we're we're at about two hours our normal time here. Um, if anybody right. has any questions, I think we're going to be wrapping up here. Um, I see one from Stephen McNeely, but if you do have a question, um, if you wouldn't mind just putting a GQ right there, ask away. Um, GQ, GQ. GQ. We'll try to get to your questions with answers. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so uh, Stephen actually asked anyone could be you me or anyone in the comments anyone. i'm adding mounted overhead speakers to my single seat home theater should the overheads be on access to my seating position um as in just two like two overheads like yeah because if it's if it's just two you're Ooh. dealing with Sorry. Like just two height channels, then yes, you want them in line with your six. Six, six channels. So six overheads. Um uh, well, I mean, yeah. Or at least the middle ones, obviously, should be st straight above you. Um, but then, there's a, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say there's a, a few videos by a, a friend of mine, Stephen Smith with home theater gurus. Um, he's got some awesome Atmos setup guides about figuring out the angles and the positioning of your Atmos speakers. Um, I'll say this right now. He made some recommendations to me that I was reluctant to do because I didn't want to reposition my at, like my height channels when I first did my uh, my I first did uh, my theater. And one thing I will say: do not put them in line with the mains. Put them like closer to like like that, that's a very popular thing if you follow the Dolby the Dolby guide. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing the in line with mains thing. You're going to get a lot of smearing with the bed layer that way. Um, yeah. But like, I don't know though. Cause I've, yeah, I've definitely heard, I mean, like, like RO 3d specifications. Uh, right. They, and so that's, they want that, it, it's a compromise, they want it right? Basically, yeah. basically mirroring your bed layer. Right. So if you're, you're mirroring it up top too. Yeah, so if you're going for a Oro 3D, then you, you probably want to do that. Um, I would say I think it's really up to you. What I can say is just from personal experience, putting like four Dolby Atmos speakers in line with the mains um, creates that smearing. And I've never heard, like, I always thought like Atmos was just okay mm -hmm. before. And then when I moved them slightly in, not exactly centered between like, the center and the the fronts yeah. right but like more like more inward like instead of i can't remember the actual degrees um i wish i could but um more kind of more inward where they're 
they're not they're not right in the middle but they're kind of more on the outside they're like if you go on like six inches from like the um No. no, your broadcast will not end. It does that every time it hits two hours. It tries to end it for us. I saw <laughs> freak Elon out. freak out. Um, yeah. yeah, it is. It, Joel does mention that it's a Atmos pl placement seems to be a topic that varies among YouTubers. Uh, definitely. Um, yeah. It also depends on how close your wall is, which is true. Very right. true. Um, I will say that uh, for me, I have a smaller room. So... Take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. Actually, take everything I say with a grain of salt because I'm just going off my <laughs> personal experience and what I found works the best. Um, I ended up uh, talking to Stephen Smith. He kind of designed a little thing for me and, and sent me, um, you know, kind of where the placement is. And essentially, it's it, it was fairly simple. Um, and if they have aimable tweeters, preferably aimable drivers, you want to aim those at like. Like for you, since it's a single position, aim them at like the opposite armrest or, or like part of the headrest. So like if it's the top front right, you want to aim it at like the like your your left over here, so you get nice mm -hmm. coverage, right? Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, for you, it probably doesn't really matter since it's single. You could probably just aim them at your ears, like wherever your head rests, just aim them there. Um, yeah. So like the angles are extremely important, uh, and if I will say this, if you have your surrounds super high already, if you can move them down, that's going to make a massive difference for your soundstage, uh, for at yeah. the separation between, because you want that separation. I noticed like when I first set up the, the back surrounds um, and they were super high, like I was telling you, Elon, there was a lot of smearing with the heights back there. I couldn't tell yeah. the difference between like what's down here. And I was doing that to kind of like combat the back of the, the theater seats, mm -hmm. but I brought them down. Cause I don't remember how high they were. They were super high, um, too high, but I brought them down to just where they clear the back of the seats. And it's such a massive difference in terms of yeah. the separation that you get more of that kind of bubble of, of sound. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you'll notice every, if you ever see a post-production facility that mixes Atmos, all their height speakers are, pointing directly at the listening yep. position yep they're all angled yeah to yep so yeah that's probably best but i mean it, i i get it if it's like if you got like a really long couch you can't necessarily do that or else all the height information is going to the very center of the couch yeah yeah and then people sitting on the side probably won't get that great of an experience but yeah and honestly like my experience was with having them like in line with the mains firing straight down not angled or anything mm -hmm. i was just like oh okay there's like a little ambience or whatever it was when i talked to steven smith it's like like my whole system came alive like i never noticed the atmos like yeah i don't want to say notice because like if you notice them all the time then they're set up wrong like you shouldn't mm -hmm. notice them all the time um but yeah, that it was kind of transformative, and I, I haven't looked back. And I'm sure that there's many different method uh, methodologies, method like methods to setting these up, right? Um, yeah. I found what works for me in my small room. I'm never going to put six in my room because it just it would probably sound worse, honestly. Oh yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> it's such a small small room. Four is like we're maxing out the the capabilities of that room i have like it's funny it's like i moved in with like 5.4.2 and now i have seven <laughs> right. seven 7.4.4 and it's like i think i'm good for where right. i'm at <laughs> yeah dude yeah right. oh yes for sure i did uh real quick sorry um spatial calibration toolkit is awesome i will agree with that i love that thing and it's nice hearing Chana in your room. Can you hear me moving? Moving. Moving around moving your room. Moving around your room. <laughs> Here I am still moving. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was, that's a great, yeah, it's a great setup thing, especially if you can actually use that to measure your Atmos channels with REW. Uh-huh. So 
Yeah, maybe look for a ch- uh, a video on how to do that if you want. <gasps> there are f- there are also free patterns out there that you could download from like obsessive compulsive audio file if you mm. like for measuring your atmos like if you didn't want to go that route. I'm just trying to let everyone know. Um, yeah, heights, Michael. I think we're talking about height speakers. We're talking about specifically like height speakers in like a Dolby Atmos or DTSX config yeah. Oro 3D. Um, although we'll see if Oro 3D actually is going to be around for the next five years or not. We'll Who see. knows? Who knows? You think Joe would like Joe and tell would like really get really pissed off. If it just dies. <laughs> <laughs> he would still do it though in his own way. Oh, yeah, he would. He would find a way. Yeah. His magic beans always find a way into your heart. Yes, <laughs> I think that's a slogan. I might have to talk to him about that slogan. <laughs> anyway. Trademark, trademark, home theater gamer, and Elon Osborne <laughs> in a world. Okay. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, I think that's gonna wrap up uh, tonight's broadcast yeah, slash podcast. Broadcast slash podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um elon do you want to close with anything you have any final thoughts or uh not really just uh you know make make the most with what you have that's uh, it whether that whether that be and and honestly you know like brad was saying your next purchase probably needs to be something to treat your room uh, whether that be acoustic panels or something so you can make them for fairly cheap and you can get some cheap wood and yeah i should know i made them yes i made them yes you did you you went you went all out yeah you have them so that i can move uh, yeah yeah, can move them around if i need to awesome all right awesome what about you any any last words (laughs) Oh, whoa. Um, No, actually, I think that, you know, if you're thinking about buying something new, you know, like Elon said, look at acoustic panels if you've never, uh, if you don't have any room treatment, that will better your sound probably more than any speakers will be able to in your current environment most of the time. Um, Also, you know, don't be afraid to, like, mess around with, like, odyssey and stuff follow some of these tutorials that are out there not just mine but like sets of compulsive audio file um try odyssey one i mean if you already have the file like give it a shot man like you really don't have anything to lose other than maybe five minutes of your time um i would like to thank michael for the Super chat, thank you so much. Tan's doing the sign of the horns with sparkles around. I'm 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 very I don't know Sparkles. Sparkles, yeah. Metallica. <laughs> right. Um metal, metal up your ass. Um <laughs> anyway. So yeah, do like mess around with that stuff, man. And uh Yeah. If you know, anything, if anything from this week's live stream go check out odyssey one see what it's all about yes obsessive compulsive audio file the guy's name i don't know i think it's sirkan or something uh-huh. um if you listen to enough of his stuff i guarantee you you will be going to bed hearing his voice in your head so <laughs> there you go um, but with that i will bid you adieu to quote larry david um curb your enthusiasm <laughs> and uh we will catch you next week yay missed you guys last week yeah glad we're back take, take care guys we'll catch you next time bye